are live online to um, uh, YouTube uh, via the FMF website, and then we'll be loaded tomorrow. Um, welcome. I, I'm Jane Boccalioni. For those who don't know, I look after media relations and communications for the Free Market Foundation. Most of your faces I, I do know. Um, today's media briefing is expropriation without compensation, and we're calling it a, the betrayal of the struggle. And this is indeed true, because it will deny the rights for black that black South, South Africans fought and died. And more importantly, or as importantly, it will deny the children of those black South Africans the rights for which they fought and died for many generations to come, up to 100 years perhaps, if the constitution is changed in this way. Um, and we are delighted to have two very good speakers with us today. One is our very own Tembo Nolashungu, who is a director with the Free Market Foundation, and he was one of the pioneers of the black consciousness movement. He fell foul of the apartheid state and um, was imprisoned for it, and has fought since then. He turned from communism to um, advocate of classical liberalism. He um, and has fought ever since for the rights and freedoms of people, and he is horrified, I can tell you, absolutely horrified at the implications of what might happen with this um, if, if the constitution is changed. He, he, Temba will speak first, and then we have, we're delighted to welcome Terence Corrigan, who is a research fellow at the Institute of Race Relations. He specializes in property rights and also land and mining rights. Um, he has... Um, a BA in political science from the University of KZN, and has held various positions at the Institute of Race Relations, South African Institute of International Affairs, um, the Houghton Legislature, and he's also, for his sins, taught English in Taiwan. I asked him before we started what, he, what else he would like me to say and what he did in his spare time, but he laughed and refused to tell me. So this is what we know about him. <laughs> well, actually, that is what he said. He has no <laughs> spare time. His spare time is spent catching up on work he should do during the day. But he did say that he has very strong interests in African governance, land and agrarian issues, political culture and thought, aid and development, corporate governance, enterprise and business uh, development policy. So that is our second speaker. Uh, he will follow our director, Tembo Nolashungu. And then Leon Lo will make closing remarks. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased uh, to have this opportunity to share with you my views, my sentiments about what is possibly about to befall us in this country. Let me start by stating that as I was monitoring the debate in the National Assembly with the motion being presented, then when I got to know that the majority of the parliamentarians actually were backing the motion, I couldn't sleep the whole night. That's how traumatized I was. I just could not comprehend how, given our history in terms of the Natives Land Act, the Glen Gray Act of 1894 that had economically castrated blacks. How could we contemplate this? How could we contemplate this measure? Given that we've heard, we've had this wonderful president, President Mandela, that there were all these parties that had come together to put together the constitution, which is one of the best in the world. And I just could not comprehend this. It took me quite a while to recover from it. Now, having said that, I just want to tell you about what I predicted was going to happen before even the resolution was implemented given force. I said there would be spontaneous outbreaks of initiatives of violence to grab whatever land that people could see. I said that. 
I said, just this, the fact of this resolution without being implemented, that it would disturb the racial fabric of the country. And that the rainbow nation we would see receding. That's what I said. And lo and behold, what happened? A group of people in Hermanas demanding land, demanding houses. This, this is all just after the adoption of the motion, which has now became which now became the resolution and now might soon be part of what will happen in South Africa going forward. Now the important thing to bear in mind is if something is enshrined in the constitution, the constitution being the supreme law of the country, it cannot be easily removed. It cannot be easily removed. So if it does happen that this initiative carries through and the amendment is affected to the constitution such that it becomes possible, permissible for land and in a broader sense property to be, to be expropriated without compensation. If that happens, heaven help us all. Now, expropriation of land without compensation does not say whites, the land that belongs to whites. And this is something that especially black people must understand. We must understand this. And the fact that you hear politicians saying that, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do anything against blacks and so on. We're going to sort it out with whites. Some of them say that, and the farm farmers and so on and so forth. That should not give any consolation to any black person because it's in the Constitution. A couple of elections down the line, there might be a totally different government to what we are, we have today, to what prevails today. And it might be a government with nefarious intentions in terms of disadvantaging a sector of the population. It could be blacks trying to sort out whites. It could be the Nguni speaking, trying to sort out the Sutu speaking, and the whites and so on. That's what it means, because this resolution gives carte blanche in terms of what can be confiscated. That is the reality. That's how sad it is. Now, I had said also, with the outbreak of violence, that we might start to see a move towards an ochlocratic order or disorder. Ochlocracy, that's the rule by the mobs. And this is what is unfolding. That's Hermanus. Look at this crowd demanding land. And there are several other incidents of land invasions Oops, sorry. Of land invasions, let me see where I should press. Mkhali, KZN, Hermanas, Western Cape, Mfuleni, Western Cape, Gugulet, Western Cape, Filippi, Western Cape, Alexandra, Gauteng, Midrand, Gauteng, and so on and so forth. And let us brace ourselves for more such spontaneous, no, they're not spontaneous. They're not spontaneous outbreaks of violence with people wanting to lay their hands on, on land and in the process being rioters and smashing up other people's properties, especially whites. Because the thing is, the government says there will be and there should be allowed expropriation of land without property. I want to use this rude analogy. If the government says we're going to make an amendment to the law, to the constitution, whereby the government can rape anybody that it wants, and you have 
people going out and raping people out there. Isn't there a correlation? There is a correlation, of course. There is a correlation. If you're going to rob people's properties, confiscate properties, you're sending out a dangerous signal out there to the malcontents and other people with, with criminal proclivities. That's what you're doing. And so, what we are seeing happening in this country, we should trace it back to that resolution that was adopted, adopted at that time. That's just, it's just plain and simple, just like that. That is the reality. Now, when I talk in these frank uh, terms, I tend to incur the wrath of the people who are architects of such pernicious legislation. But I don't give a damn, because the thing is, I have my conscience. I knew what apartheid was like. I know what my grandparents experienced as a result of the Natives Land Act. But the point is, we're here now. We need to move forward. That did not happen to me. It happened to my ancestors. It happened to my grandparents. So why should I be angry? Why is it when the Institute of Race Relations has come up with some figures to the effect that about two thirds of people who when given an option of owning land or farms, they settle for cash. They settle for cash. What is it? What is behind this? It has to do with the political opportunism of those in politics with the elections around the corner. And they just don't give a damn about hap what happens to the country. They don't. Now, is they, 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 those who advocate this measure, they often quote Saul T. Plachy, the author of this wonderful book, Native Life in South Africa. Let me just spend one or two, three minutes in terms of the Native Land Act as Saul Plachy and the others were engaging that act and trying to stop it from being enacted. They tried their best because they knew what was going to happen, that black people were going to be economically emasculated. And that happened. And hence, that is why Saul Plachy said words to the effect. And I'm trying to quote him. If not, then I see it as paraphrasing what he had said. I waking on Friday morning, 20th June 1913, the native South African native found himself not actually a slave but a pariah in the land of his birth. <coughs> that was all like him. Now, what the politicians do. Those who are behind this EWC, that's short for expropriation without compensation, behind the EWC initiative, what they do is that they just cite this part. Recently, this has been the occurrence in recent times. But they don't read any further. You can be sure that many of them, we know that they don't like to study anything or read anything. That they just page through the first couple of, pa of the book pages of the book, and then they say, ah, Saul, Saul Plachy would be endorsing this. No, not at all. Because from this book by Saul Plachy, I'm going to read out what he said when he was trying to deal with his friends and uh, trying to deal with the Native Land, Land Act, which was a bill at the time. And this is what he said. The foregoing result of a legislative jumble is the law. And this law, like Alexander the Coppersmith, hath done us much harm. Mr. Samuel carried his bill less by reason than by sheer force of numbers, and partly by promises which he afterwards broke. Now, this sentence. This paragraph is pregnant with meaning.
because here Sobraki is decrying the fact that that motion had carried and the Natives Land Act became a reality through as a result of uh, the majoritarian dictatorship situation, the tyranny of the majority. That is what is implied here. That is what he is saying. This is Saul Plaiki. If Saul Plaiki was alive today and he saw what was happening, I think he would die a second death. I think he would die a second death. Later on, let me share with you in this very same book, his comments on the legislative process that culminated in the adoption of the Natives Land Act. This is what he said. Oh, first of all, let me deal with this. Some people have asked me in the US where I've given talks and in some cases where audiences have invited me to address them on this issue or other related issue related to this. And they said, how was this enforced? How was the Natives Land Act enforced? Let me just share this with you. Lest we, or lest, lest I be criticized as a denialist or an apologist for what was done during the colonial administration and later on the apartheid administration. Blackie records that on the 31st of January, 1914, the magistrate of Lady Smith issued the following order as addressed to 79 native families in his district. To Vellum CBC, Crawlhead residing in one of the following farms, namely remainder of Brackfontaine, remainder of Weltefriere, etc., etc., etc. Take notice, in terms of settlement for of law of, of 41, that you are required to remove with your crow and inmates from whichever of the said farms you may be residing on. Six months from this date, the aforementioned farms having been purchased by government for closer settlement purposes. This, was, this is how these pernicious pieces of uh, legislation were enforced during that time. But Listen to this now. This is all Plaiki. Commenting on the legislative process. Look at the weighty arguments delivered inside and outside of Parliament against the Natives Land Act. Surely, no legislature with a sense of responsibility could have passed that law after hearing arguments of such force and weight against it. But the South African legislature passed that act and seems to glory in the wretched result of its operation. If Saul Plaiki was around, and he had seen what was unfolding in Parliament in terms of the debate around this motion, which later on became a, a resolution, he would be saying exactly the same words. Exactly the same words. So I have a problem with policymakers, with parliamentarians particularly, when they cite some passages from this great man's book because Saul Plaiki would be dead set against this. Now, some people have said that, oh, Temba, maybe uh, you are holding this view because nobody in your family was ever affected by such pernicious policies, the Native Land Act particularly. Oh, no. That's not the case of, at all. That is, I can show you, if you look at this man, this is my grandfather, paternal gr grandfather, Temba Tainton Nolichungu, after whom I am named. He built his house in Crown Mines. He himself, unsubsidized by the company, by the government, he built it. And he raised his family in Crown Mines. He kicked the bucket 
And afterwards, it was easy for the government to deal with the property. It was confiscated. And my father and his siblings then became dispersed throughout Johannesburg. I know that this man, you can, you can, you, you can see this as a tribute to him to, to some extent, he would never have gone along with what is happening. So I always say to people, don't talk nonsense. When you say with people who are critically engaging this, this EWC resolution, don't say they are saying that because they have never suffered or do not have any of their ancestors having experienced any of the difficulties that have been occasioned by the Native Land Act and other pieces of legislation that were later adopted by the Nationalist Party. It just does not make sense. Now the thing is, the debate around this issue has been so sickly so sickly racialized that if you are a white person, you dare not say anything at all. You dare not say anything at all. You can just easily be shut down by those who engage you purely on the basis that you're a white person. You are pining for the good old days. You're a racist. You're against black people and all of that nonsense. And if you are a black person, you are going to be accused of breaking ranks with the blacks. Or maybe being called a traitor. It is just so racialized. But the point is, this is an issue that needs to be engaged because if it is not energetically and critically engaged, we are going to find a South Africa that Mandela would be so ashamed of. Now, where is this coming from? Let me repeat this again. It's coming from this sick need to want to punish the whites. It's from retribution, a sentiment of retribution. It is also from envy. You, you can be sure it is safe to assume that there must, there must be some people who are close to government or those in government who might have their eyes on some specific lands. You can be sure about that. It's an assertion that I am very auda audacious to make and I am saying that if this passes through, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Now, if we look at what, uh, 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 at what there might, whether there might be any alternatives to the EWC, remember that's the expropriation without compensation story, expropriation of land. There are feasible alternatives that the government could very easily implement very easily implement. And one of those is to make it possible for people who've been living, whose families have been living for generations in council-owned properties, in government-owned properties. Make it possible for them to be legal owners via a freehold unencumbered title deed. Very easy, very easy. It would be very, very easy. If you could take part of the money that was siphoned in Tungandla and you threw it at this project and you were paying the conveyancing attorneys, conveyancing firms, this could be easily implemented. Now, it, I, I wanted to say it's a, bit, it's a bit encouraging that one is hearing noises from government that it is intending to embark on this initiative. But politicians are politicians. And, and so on this project, and it, 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 in some cases, it has been downplayed as trying to deflect attention away from the EWC. No, 
It isn't. Because it was Mandela himself who understood the importance and, and significance of, and spiritual significance of owning a home, owning a house. In his own words, he said, and I quote him, a man is not a man until he has a house of his own. The words of Mandela. That was Mandela. Now some people have said, well, this is a sexist statement, rubbish. That's not sexist. Because I, uh, I understand, I can, I can really relate to Mandela saying this. Because for me, as a traditional, you could say, a traditional man, male man, it is, I've always seen it as my responsibility as a man, and I've seen it as the responsibility of every man to protect the family, especially the women, women folk, and to provide for the family. That is Mandela's perspective. That is Mandela. That this is where this was coming from. So we're here in South Africa faced with this huge, huge challenge to us. And it seems that the Rainbow Nation, as I have said, is coming apart. It is disintegrating. Now, politicians saying, no, 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 that's not going to happen. And the thing is, it all has to happen in a way that it can relate and does not relate to and does not threaten food security. That's a contradiction in terms. If Tam Manoli Chung, who knows nothing about farming, suddenly becomes a farmer as a result of this EWC, that's going to threaten food security. If you remove agriculturally productive lands from the people who are currently running those, those businesses, those agribusinesses, and you place them in the hands of somebody like Temba Noluchongo, who knows nothing about farming. This is not just hip hypothetical. Who knows nothing about farming? Then we are going to see a drop in food production, in food quality. That's what we're going to see. So it's a contradiction in terms to say in the same breath, oh yeah, that we embrace the EWC, but we'll make sure that there isn't going to be any threats, any threat to food security. That's rubbish. It is utterly nonsensical, irrational, and uh, it does not make sense at all whatsoever. And so we, the Free Market Foundation, have decided to make uh, our work around the EWC a top priority. Because the thing is, in terms of the free market paradigm or the paradigm of economic freedom, the protection of private property is sacrosanct. It is of paramount importance. And to any individual for that matter, owning their property is sacrosanct. If you remove that constitutionally, then you're going to have problems. Because it means that you would be very seriously affecting the thing that most people, that everybody holds dear, that is individual liberty. That is liberty, that is freedom. That is what you would be doing. This is how serious this is. Uh, let me just check, Jane, am I doing fine time-wise? Now, we have a situation in this country where with this EWC, there are some associations, some, some of them being business associations, who endorse this on the basis of what politicians are saying to them. No, 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 we're not going to disturb, disturb the economic status quo. It's not going to do that at all. And some very naively buy into this. We're talking about smart people who run fantastic businesses. And they are swallowing this 
hook, line, and sinker, a rhetoric from the politicians. Now, we know that with elections around the corner, politicians tend to indulge in populist rhetoric, which is also the story behind this EWC. And they listen, and they hear some people saying, oh, Mandela did not do anything. He betrayed us black people, and so which is rubbish, which is a load of, which is a truckload of nonsense. And they say that. And they say, oh, yeah, yeah. We need to expropriate land without compensation because now they have calculated the way they perceive it that come 2019 elections, that's going to give them the numbers. Yeah, that's going to give them the votes. That is how they're thinking. They are not thinking in terms of the big picture. They are not thinking in, in, in the long term in terms of what's going to happen. Not at all. Now, the country needs, at this point in time, a leadership of integrity, a leadership that has a vision, a leadership that has a fixity of purpose in terms of the right policies that have to be implemented for the greatest good of all people. Mandela always kept on saying that he is not just the president of the ANC, that most importantly when he held that position, he was the president of the country. That's what Mandela kept on saying, I am the president of the country. Now we have politicians who do not talk in terms of the big picture, in terms of the whole country, and who are talking in terms of what can be done in order for their political parties to get more votes come 20, 2019. Now, that is so sickly, uh, uh, morally promiscuous. In other words, you're saying we have no principles. We're going to suspend the principles. We're going to suspend our values. And we're just going for votes whatever we think is going to serve our end in terms of getting more votes, that is what we're going to pursue. That's what we're going to implement. That is the problem that we're faced with. Mandela, I think of him, and I say, if Mandela was around, if he was the president, none of this would have happened. Because Mandela was the president of the country, as he kept on emphasizing over and over again. But now, one might say, well, now I'm being critical of the leadership. Of course, I have a duty to be critical of, of the leadership, of political leadership in the political arena. I have to, because what comes out of parliament, what emanates out of parliament as policy, has an effect on the greatest number of people in this country. And so it is my duty, it is my responsibility to be critical within reasonable limits. When I say reasonable limits, what I'm talking about is good to criticize, but I come up with something else to be considered, right? As opposed to the EWC that we're contemplating in this country. That's me. And uh, Mandela, I keep talking about him. And the politicians keep on saying, especially those in the ruling party of the ANC, um, this is not being critical of the ANC, it's being critical of what of the voices that are emanating uh, from, 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 from that political party. They all say, no, nobody can talk authoritatively on Nelson Mandela if they were not members of the ANC. Rubbish, yeah, Mandela was the president of the country, and I got to, to know so much about that man. And one doesn't have to listen to any politician saying to them, oh, you, you should not be talking about Mandela, nobody should talk about Mandela and so on, because we know how he would be thinking. Oh yes, we know how he would be thinking. Mandela would have decried the fact that this EWC is being motivated by the sentiments of retribution and envy. 
And Mandela would say, remember my words in my book, No Easy Walk to Freedom. Remember my words, and I quote them, as I walked out the door towards the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew that if I did not leave hatred or and bitterness behind, I would still be in prison. That was Mandela. On that note, I don't want to exceed my time limit, and uh, that ends my, 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 my talk on this matter. I'd be more than happy for interaction afterwards, after Terry will have delivered his part. And I did not want to inflict on you a whole presentation of PowerPoint so that you might die by PowerPoint or something. So anyway, I'm around, I'm available, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid, um, while Timber uh, uh, chose not to, as he said, inflict a, a PowerPoint, um, I'm going to do that with glee, if I can work out how this, how this works. Um, yeah, um, yeah, we'll have it. Oh, there we go. I grew up um, in the, in the pre-technology era, you know, when you had dial phones that my mother used to lock. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, first of all, thank, um, can everyone hear me? Um, I want to thank the Free Market Foundation for giving me this opportunity. Uh, we at, at, at the Institute of Race Relations have a long-standing um, uh, friendship and uh, uh, really value the, value the inputs that, um, uh, that FMF um, uh, puts out into our, into our public debate things that need to be said and frequently are dismissed out of hand. Generally speaking, a prophet is never, is never recognized in his own land nor in his own time. Uh, when I was younger, I wanted to be a minister of religion, so I'm able to do that. Um, what I want to talk about is what this measure symbol uh, signifies and what its, what its significance is. Okay. Um, can anybody help me with this? <laughs> uh, hold on. Uh, there we go. Well, we're on. Okay. We seem to be we seem to be moving here, but jammed on the screen. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. So, as we all know, on the 27th of February, Parliament adopted a motion to investigate the introduction of a policy of expropriation without compensation. I put this up here because there's a few things I'd like to, em I'd like to emphasize. First of all, it had a kind of declaratory clause. Uh, black South Africans own only 2% of rural land and 7% of urban land. Bear that in mind. I'll be coming back to that. It required two things, and this has often slipped out of, um, out, out of the public debate. The first thing was... Um, an examination of Section 25 of the Constitution, the so-called property, property clause. Those of you who um, uh, have a bit of snow on the, on the roof will remember that this was the most uh, closely contested issue in the constitutional negotiations in the 1990s by a considerable, um, a considerable distance, as well as a future tenure system for South Africa. Be, do not lose sight of that second point. That is actually where, where the devil lives. And since then, numerous figures in both the, the ruling party and government, I think we do have to make a distinction, have reiterated their commitment to the plan. Um, President Ramaphosa once memorably said that this would, transfer South Af this would transform South Africa into a Garden of Eden. Um, one should bear in mind, though, that we were evicted from the Garden of Eden, and what you get now is the promised land that takes 40 years in the wilderness to arrive at. Why is this happening? Now, the first thing I'd like to say is what, what's not happening. And I think this is also where I probably have some, some disagreements with Timber. We do not believe this is because of a, of a rise in populism. We don't believe this is about a misdirected resolution. Nor is it about, uh, about a growing hunger for land or frustration at obstacles to land reform. 
Um, and I think this is also something that needs to be, that needs to be taken apart very carefully and, and, and interrogated. Bear something in mind, We've done, we, we do extensive polling, rural and urban South Africans. Land for farming, now I want to just separate this out from, from urban land, which is, a, uh, which is, which is um, a separate issue. Only 1% to 2% of respondents believe that that is what is going to improve their lives. If you don't, if you don't want to believe race relations, look at Afrobarometer. I think they, I think they give you 2%. Um, the idea that there is a drive to resettle and uh, live a bucolic pastoral existence on the land, it's, um, it's nonsense. Um, South Africa is two-thirds urbanized and populations do not, de do not de urbanize unless, like in Cambodia, you, you have a government forcing you to do it at the point of a gun. This is not even unique to South Africa. It's, it's happening across, um, across the continent. I think in about 30 years, Africa will be a majority, a majority, urban, um, uh, will be a majority urban continent. Uh, it's happened long ago in Europe and North America. The uh, vision of the Australian out uh, outbacker, that's also quite, quite ridiculous. Only if tourists ever believe that. No one in Australia does. Okay, so what is happening? Understand this is not about land, this is about property. Section 25 is the property clause, not the land clause. And I don't know how many people, how many radio talk shows I have to, I have to explain this to. This is the culmination, we believe, of a, decade, of a decade's worth of uh, incremental assault on, on, on property rights. It goes back to about 2007, 2008, when, and that is where you actually see policy changing. Particularly under, under President Mbeki, the idea was to try and bring, um, bring black people who had been excluded from property ownership into a, um, uh, into, a, uh, into a system of property ownership and property rights, create a, you know, a, a facilitating the creation of, of, um, of uh, owner farmers, that sort of thing. Um, what we have seen, uh, we, we've counted more than 20, but probably about 26 distinct attempts which would have one thing in common. It, they would shrink the uh, discretion of private individuals and, priv and private uh, firms over their, over their holdings and expand the government's discretion in respect of those. Once again, not just all about land. Intellectual properties come under, come under fire. Um, shareholdings, equities. The other thing to bear in mind is that for, for reasons that Timber very eloquently um, explained, land is a very, very sensitive uh, wedge issue. Um, no one, I think, who is, who is familiar with South Africa's history cannot be moved by, this, by, this, by the suffering that has been associated with it. It's, it therefore, in political terms, makes a very, very uh, good precedent. It's very clever politics. Understand also that there is, a, there is an intellectual tradition behind this. Um, a, the, um, ANC policy thinking, the so-called National Democratic Revolution. Um, a great deal has been written about this. But I'd just like to, like to emphasize two things. By the time this has reached its culmination, three, there'll, there'll, be three, there'll be three things at play. First of all, there is an historic um, hostility to capitalism. That implies that a future economic system will be a, a very statist one. And I think if you speak to the ANC's leading lights, they generally are, um, are on board with this. Uh, under, the, uh, under the Mbeki presidency, the idea was more to, um, uh, to yoke capitalism to, uh, to its agenda, to, to, to use its dynamism, but um, we were once told by, um, uh, by an ANC MP of, uh, who was quite sympathetic to, to, to the Institute, you cannot badmouth socialism. Um, and this was during the time of Gear, you know, when the ANC had a, had, a, had, a, had, a, had a flirtation with it. Party dominance, the ANC will be the, uh, will be the only game in town. Well, not necessarily in a one-party state, probably not, but one in which everyone knows who, uh, who the boss is and... Those of you who choose to uh, chaotically go off in a different direction will ultimately have to come back to the ANC to ask for favors. Demographic, demographic representativity, that there is something in, um, inherently natural about things being apportioned in all spheres according to, um, according to racial, gender, and you know, whatever other um, uh, proportions. Now, the, one of the biggest political um, uh, phenomena over, um, over the last 10 years has been the ANC has seen part, part of its support chipped away, but not to, not, not to opposition parties so much. It's lost two factions within itself. COPE took nearly 10%, the EFF nearly 7 That That, that dwarfs whatever, whatever the DA has been able to do. Now, land is, is an issue which, as I say, I, I do not, we, we, we don't find much evidence for, uh, for there being a great um, a land hunger on the part of ordinary people. Uh, the housing issue in, 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 in urban areas is perhaps an exception to that. But it is one that has a great deal of ideological significance and, you, and elites can get very excited about it. 
Could this be a, a possible preparation for a reunion between, uh, between the ANC and the EFF? Um, we believe that, there's the, the, that there are indications of that. And to some extent, by focusing on this, on, on the land issue, on the historical injustices, you can direct, divert attention from big failings elsewhere, employment, um, urban governance, basically the things that actually chew at, uh, chew at the lives of most South Africans. It's a, um, there's a deficient education. Thing that, uh, the, thing that South Africa's poor, the things that South Africa's poor desperately need to get ahead are not, are not provided, and this provides an alternative narrative. Now, I mentioned more than 20 distinct, uh, distinct initi uh, initiatives, uh, just a few of them. Um, talk about the AgriBE Charter. Um, proactive land acquisition strategy option to purchase removed. At one stage, the, the government would, um, uh, would give uh, land reform beneficiaries the right to, um, uh, to obtain freehold ownership. That disappeared in 2010. Green paper and land reform, you know, um, uh, much, much more emphasis on, on, on state holding. And this one particularly, state land lease and disposal po policy. This says there are four that when it comes to redistribution, this is not restitution, not about people uh, regaining historic property, but in terms of the government wanting to, um, uh, uh, to enable or create uh, a new class of farmers. Um, th we divide them into four, into four categories, and only the very largest, only those able to, f to farm on a substantial commercial basis can ever hope to own those, those land holdings, and that after 50 years. In other words, keep yourself fit. Um, the small guys who might be going into for a little bit of peasant farming or a place to stay, it's unambiguous. You will never own it. This will be state property forever. And, in a, and you know, we won't talk about expropriation without compensation. That same document makes it, makes it explicit that any improvements that you, uh, you put on your land, should you decide to vacate, will, uh, will become state property with no compensation. So there. It's a <laughs> in that sense, <laughs> we already have expropriation without compensation. Um, the expropriation bills, uh, land holding framework, uh, preservation development of agricultural land. The idea that all land, that all agricultural land, would now become uh, would now fall into state custodianship. This kind of grey area between outright nationalisation and, 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 and private ownership. But the key thing is, those who would previously have, have owned this as their property would not anymore. You would need all sorts of licensing and whatever, very much like the um, uh, like the the, the Mineral uh, Petroleum Act. Petroleum Act. Okay, that's that's the context. This is what's been uh, what's been happening before uh, before the twenty seventh of February, before you know it got a name and a brand. I want to talk about this idea, custodianship. And this is why I say be very very careful. Don't just think about this in terms of um, in terms of Section twenty five and what happens to the Constitution, the land tenure. Now, custodianship is a critically important idea here. What it basically says is that um, this is a relationship where, where a particular type of property, as currently in the case of minerals, but which could very, very easily be turned over, be, be turned on land, um, becomes the not, not so much the property of land, but something in, uh, not, not so much the property of government, but something within government's purview and power. In other words, you don't really get to own it anymore. You um, may work it if the government agrees, um, but the government doesn't own it either. So when it takes possession, as it did with, with minerals, there is no compensation payable. Constitutional court ruled on that, and they were very, very, very careful to say this is only about this case, but it's a logic that we think could be, um, uh, could be rolled out. It has appeared in, in, in policy, it has appeared in, in, in legislation, and interestingly enough, it was one of the three uh, recommendations in the land or in the government's land audit that uh, that was that was produced last year, but kind of released earlier this year. The original parliamentary motion before the ANC twisted it a bit was unambiguous. The imperative, I think, it was the imperative of the state to to, to, to own all land. And I, th I think um, uh, one of the leaders of the EFF actually said, you know, what's all this concern about who's going to own anything? No one is going to own anything. The state will own it all. Your title deed will be meaningless. You know, uh, you will get. You know, um, a commissar or bureaucrat or whatever will decide whether you are. Um, uh, you have a right to be there. What you can do, what you can plant, and you know, you will fall in line, and we'll all march together. Um, the interesting thing is, wouldn't require a constitutional change. If we take the constitutional court ruling so far, this could probably be pushed through without touching the constitution. Um, 
and it would also deepen the precedent and make other sectors vulnerable. Um, in the um, in legislation that was uh, that was being processed last year, but uh, seems now to be uh, to be on the back burner, there was the idea that the state would be able to sort of take free carried interests in in, in, mineral, in petroleum exp exploration, and then you know another chunk further down the line. Once you've got this, that becomes very very easy. Um, so those of you who um, who think that this is just for, this is just for you know farmer your hand somewhere out in the free state, be careful. Now the land audit. Um, this uh, wanted to answer one of the fundamental questions, who owns what, because no one really knew. Um, and it took us to about, 20, about 20 years before, um, uh, before people actually started to try and, uh, try and compile it. Now, um, we have uh, exam examined this in great detail. It's confusingly compiled and it needed a, it needed a good edit. Um, the numbers that don't add up, the, you know, it's, it didn't seem to have been given the, the, um, the attention it deserved. But there's a few things I'd like to point out. We know that they relied on census data. We also know that sentence data has about a, um, a non-response ratio of about 19% or so. This is what a, a, what a prominent economist tells me. There is not a single don't know or not, or not available in that report. You know, somehow, with incomplete information, we have, a, we, we have what is presented as a global picture. Contrary to the way that this has been repeatedly um, put forward, including by the Minister of Land Affairs, I believe that, that our diplomats are very, um, are very pleased at the switch because, you know, there was, there, there was problematic. Um, it couldn't put a racial identity on two-thirds on two of what is, um, what is owned in South Africa. And it's quite simple because the way that property, that, that land holding works now, increasingly doesn't, doesn't work like that. It's companies, trusts, etc., etc. The idea of, of, of the individual owning a large farm, that's, that's going away, that's dying. Um, and as I say, it's been repeatedly misrepresented. Um, one, often he, one often hears that figure, black people own only 2% of, of, of the country. Okay, now if, if, I, if I look at that, well then, mentally I'm going to switch, switch my mind over and say, well then, whites own 98%. Wow, that's, that's, that's like way worse than it was in 1913. Um, well, no, um, because state land, which is, a, which is almost a quarter of the country, um, is, what, is, is, is basically what, is, uh, uh, what was the former homelands. The Ngunyama Trust is probably the biggest single street, um, a, 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 a piece of land holding in the country. It, it sort of disappears from those figures. Um, BE deals disappear because they're generally done with community property associations or with companies. Uh, virtually all of government's uh, land reform initiatives vanish because those are generally done with community property associations or with trusts, which, are not, uh, which do not carry that sort of, that sort of racial, racial identity. Um, so I think that this, the, there's been something very unsound about the way this has been, um, uh, this has been presented, even within, you know, even accepting all of its, all, all of its other, all of its other foibles. A particular, it's been used to drive a particular narrative which doesn't stand up to an to actual reading of the document. And this has gone all the way up to, all the way up to the top. Pre President Ramaphosa has actually been a little more honest in that he says, well, Yes, it's four percent of land owned, pri owned by private individuals. Yes, but that's only about thirty percent of um, uh, of the country, um, and it's an extremely difficult point to get across. I went on to um, onto television to to, uh, to explain to um, uh, to one of the journalists about about what the problem was, and he kept on saying, "Yes, but um, you know, this is all from credible sources." So, well, not from credible sources, but it's not being credibly presented, and. Those of you who look, you know my Facebook page, can go and you can go watch it. It was very frustrating. Um, now we also have um, the uh, recommendations: custodial taking plus a land tax. Basically, it's a it's a double whammy for anyone owning property. You don't own it, but you get to pay for it. Ha! All right. So now the committee will review the matter. Public co uh, comment is open. Course of action to be recommended. Um, the idea that uh, you know the, the the ANC and the EFF together can uh, can push this through. If there's a constitutional change, they have the numbers. There's not there's not much um, uh, much more to be said about that. But here's what I'd like to point out. Um, those of you who watched the um, who, who watched the land summit will note that uh, there's, there, there seems to be some movement that the con that section 25 may not be may not be amended. 
Something that has not been remarked on uh, in any great length has been the idea that um, we need that 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 the expropriation bill, which is uh, which was passed by Parliament last year, then or year before, and then and then passed, uh, then um, sent to President Zuma, who wouldn't sign it because there were procedural issues, needs to be reworked to include this, uh, to include uh, expropriation without compensation. Now that bill. Uh, expanded gov uh, uh, government's reach into property exponentially. It made it very difficult for all but the, uh, but, but the biggest players to, uh, to really mount any kind, of, uh, any kind of defense when government comes knocking. Um, the idea was bring that bill back and attach expropriation without compensation. In other words, you know, while we, while we say the Constitution is fine, we're good constitutionalists. Well, we come in through the back door and in practical terms, uh, we end up with um, uh, with a very very concerning outcome. I think also that 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 what I'm seeing um, on the part of uh, of some in business is the idea that this is on the table. We need to cut a deal. Uh, we won't oppose the um, uh, we we can't oppose the principle. Maybe we can sort of protect ourselves. You know. Um, if we have to throw agriculture under the bus, well, maybe it's okay, you know, because mining and banking or whatever will um, uh, will be able to walk away unscathed. I think, though, that this is um, that, that this will ultimately prove to be um, prove to be a large mistake because I don't think it will stop there. I think there's a certain nature of the beast here that uh, you know once we um, uh, once we've established the precedent to intervene in this industry, well, why not that one? Um, now, postscript. This is. I think the saddest thing. Um, I often um, I'm often challenged when I uh, uh, when, when I do interviews. But are you so insensitive to the two injustices? I say no. It's because of those injustices that I'm actually sitting here. We've seen around the world. Um, I like to, to to refer to China. I like to refer to Brazil before they before their big sporting events. That it's not that uh, you know when 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 government comes to build a road or gentrify an area because there's going to be lots of well-heeled uh, foreign tourists here, or build a nice big a uh, nice big stadium, uh, you're not gonna, you're not going to be doing it in the equivalent of Santon. You'll face you'll be knee-deep in lawyers by you know by by lunchtime and nothing will get off the ground. However, you know you can you go to Alexandra. Um, Yes, you people, of course, do have they do have a right to protest. Um, you know, we can give you the names of some lawyers. Can you can you raise a hundred thousand by you know by the end of the day? Um, it was one it, it was once said by one of our um, by one of our previous uh, uh, previous presidents of the institute. Property rights are not because the affluent want them, but because the poor need them. Because often that is what uh, that is what 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 protects them. When you don't have um, uh, have the minister's number on speed dial, when you don't have um, have a high priced law firm uh, to come and help you out, or what you have maybe is a principle. As far as land reform goes, though, there is a problem. I'm I'm very much in favour of um, of restitution measures, and I think that uh, um, world history has shown that uh, redistribution, properly uh, uh, properly conceived, can be can be a wonderful thing for enhancing a market economy. What we have got, got though, with land reform, and this is government's own own argument, uh, President Mutlanti's uh, panel, political will, efficient project design, limited and adequate budgets, administrative incapacity, etc., 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 etc. EWC does nothing to address any of this, and you know, essentially, by by shifting the focus, ensures it's that uh, that it will continue. Um, you know, from one from one bad situation onto one that's likely to be a lot worse. And with that, um, I'm also very much available to uh, take any questions. Um, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, my name's Rob Jeffrey. Um, it's a pretty well-known fact that almost all the major mining companies are leaving, uh, or not expanding rapidly yeah, in this country because of uh, concern about property rights going forward and the fact that there's a 50% that's been required on certain occasions. 
But more important, I want to know what is going to happen to the banking system. The banking system lends money, and I don't know how much money is involved in land. Forget about land, you then have companies. The banks lend money to companies. Suddenly, they have assets that are going to disappear. Or most banks, uh, financial institutions and credit providers, actually look at how good is the bona fides of the owner, let alone anybody else, apart from the asset. Obviously, uh, no land means no asset. Uh, and suddenly, that's uncertain. So will this not lead to a financial collapse on a very broad scale? To, um, are we answering one by one? or? Uh, it's a general question, uh, you know. Who would like to take that? Yeah, let me just respond to that in broad, in broad terms. What I can say uh, about the EWC, look at the entire economy, including the financial services sector, meaning the banks, is that what is contemplated and what the impact might be will be too ghastly to contemplate, <laughs> to use the words of uh, the late... Uh, Prime Minister of Bawa yes, Bawa Too costly to contemplate. I cannot dwell with precision in terms of what the impact would be on the, on the banking industry. But I can share something with you with regards to the mining sector. When I was in New York and I was interacting with people, I haven't been invited to address them on issues that really that, that relate to the EWC. There were two investors who are very heavily, significantly invested in the mining industry. They said, look, Tema, I just want to ask a bottom line question, one of them said. He said, give me advice. Do I disinvest now? Do I wait? And if I wait, what do I wait for? You know, that's the sort of threat on the horizon that we are perceiving. But, and you can imagine that the banks are thinking that, whoa, if the invested, investors currently invested in the country start investing, that certainly is going to have an impact on the banks because they'll be losing all that capital which will be going to other African countries. And beyond that, which would be going to other business-friendly markets. So that's my broad response to the question that you're asking. Over to you, Terence. Um, in, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of banks' exposure to, to agriculture, it's, about a, it's estimated to be, to be between 160 and 180 billion rand. Um, Yes. Because it's not just agriculture we're talking about. No, sure. It's every urban property where people no, no, sure. have probably 50% bonds. Yeah. And yeah. that could be expropriated tomorrow. Yeah, no, I, look, I, I, just, I, I just want to um, uh, want to address this uh, to, to, uh, to agriculture because this is where, um, uh, where some, sort of, some sort of thinking has, has taken place. Now, um, the head of the Banking Association warned back before, actually before the ANC's resolution on this, that to go down this route um, is likely to chase, uh, to chase financiers out. The, look, there are various permutations. Um, if government did take a sort of um, uh, a massive custodial taking, I think it, it, it would essentially destroy most, uh, all but, 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 uh, but the largest agricultural um, uh, businesses. Um, it's possible that 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 some um, that some larger players might be willing to work on long-term leases uh, if they could if they could source source funding. But fundamentally, this would destroy the the, uh, the capital base of, of of agriculture. Now, as far as as far as your your uh, your urban property goes, yeah, I think I think that that that, that, that would be um, uh, be catastrophic too. Um, I understand Judas Malema said, "No, don't worry, they're going to talk to the bank and everyone will get a discount." So, those of you those of you who haven't paid off your bonds, maybe this is something you should hope for. Uh, but no. <laughs> well, look, 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 look. You know, I think, I think, I think that that that, that in that sort of environment, you you, uh, you 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 make a decent point. 
I think that that the the, the willingness of um, of banks to expose themselves to to, to any sort of risk would start to, to to hinge around kind of backroom conversations. Is this guy politically uh, you know connected? Can he um, uh, you know is 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 his investment okay? Whereas an identical one by someone else might be very iffy. Um, you know, um, and I, I think I think the banking industry certainly would uh, would probably look at, uh, at, ma- at, at at making its fortunes elsewhere. You know, outside um, uh, outside South Africa as much as, as as much as it could. Look, you know, I think I think fundamentally a, bus- a, a business will will, uh, will will invest where it th- where it thinks it makes money, and you and you've got to you know factor that in. I think this would cut off the legs of the ability to um, of 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 many industries to to uh, to function profitably. So I'm going to stand up and I think you'll hear me better. Um, my name is Lisa. Um, I'm here in my private capacity, thanks. Um, I have an observation to make based on my perception of what I've been seeing and what I've been hearing of this. And coming particularly in the wake of the Zuma administration, for me, it, it's about political survival. Not political will or anything else like that. I think a lot of it is about political survival. So that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. And there's constantly this tension as well um, in government and in the governing party as to which way they're going to go. It was very interesting, um, your slide about the history of where it was coming from, coming from 2007, et cetera, et cetera, how this steady encroachment was, was sort of attempted. But what worries me is because it is about, in my perception, a a survival issue, is all of these arguments and these things that one is saying seems to me to be obvious and rational. The the consequence, particularly, of of what you perceive. What worries me is how much weight in the face of of potential survival or potential power hungriness will that carry? The second thing is, if one looks at the wording of the of the um, Section 25 of the Constitution, it talks about expropriation may not happen without compensation, but there's that sort of thing about deprivation, which is, I think, where the custodianship um, um, comes in, which worries me exceptionally, particularly because it's already there, you know, and how, how that can be abused, I want to say, to achieve their measures. So. So, so I would like your comments to say, h- how effective do you think the opposition to this will actually be? Are we pushing towards a point where we're going to find a midway? I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Or or should we sort of start preparing f- for, a, for an alternative universe? I don't know. Look, I think that... that um, in our view, a lot of this is, is heavily ideological. Um, you know, the, uh, I, do, I, I generally try to avoid the, uh, using the phrase the ANC because it's a, it's a very big organization and there are, um, uh, there are reformers and there are, uh, there are, I know for a fact that people who share these concerns. Um, but I think this is ingrained into, um, in, uh, in, into its intellectual tradition. And I think that that, carry, that carries an enormous weight. Um, I think that you know, going going out going outside the ANC, um, there's a there's a large constituency that uh, that's that's entranced by radical solutions, uh, not so much because of what they promise, but simply because they are radical. Um, you'd be surprised how um, uh, how easy it is to find someone who can who, who can wax ly- who can wax lyrical about Venezuela, which is a basket case now. Um, but you know, the, 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 there's a, there's a certain heady attraction um, uh, um, attractiveness to this. Um, our experience is that um, is that s- uh, sustained pressure can be um, uh, ca- can be effective. Um, many of those uh, the uh, those antecedent um, uh, um, attempts were um, uh, were fought, uh, were fought off. Um, but you know, if if you um, if if you're going to resign and you're not going to be in the game, you've got you've you've uh, you've got you've got no chance. Um, I think though that uh, what 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 concerns me now is that with the way that that that, that President Ramaphosa was speaking of um, over the weekend, that well, you know, we or we're going to try and do it within the constitution. I think a lot of people who would otherwise be be very alert to this danger will now back off and say, well, you know, it's just a policy thing now. It's it's it's, it's not something about the rules of the game. 
um, I, think, I think that, you know, something can be entirely constitutional and a complete stranger to reason. And I think that, you know, w uh, whether this is done within the Constitution or, or outside, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very ominous, um, uh, ominous development of, uh, uh, for the country. What do they say? Af uh, South Africa is not for sissies. Yeah, just to, uh, to add some point and uh, alluding to, what, uh, to that point that you raised, Lisa, certainly uh, it makes sense for us to, to perceive that there is an element of political expedience in this, in this, in this initiative, namely the EWC. Uh, people are dangerous. People are dangerous in terms of being open to, to any suggestion that they perceive might advance their electoral fortunes, their electoral fortunes. So in that sense, that's rational. It is rational, but also, also dangerous for the whole country because they think about the short term and are not focused on the, in the medium term or the long term. They think in terms of the small picture, elections around the corner, and catering to the needs of those people that they see whose backing will translate into increased votes and not looking at the big picture, looking at everybody, what is in the best interest of everybody. That is how this is why this is so dangerous. And on the point as to whether maybe one should explore some midway, uh, you know, that would be a dangerous route to contemplate. We shouldn't do that. Because the thing is, we want 100% protection of property, of private pro property, essentially. We want 100% protection of that. If we have that, then we're going to, to move on as a country. If we have that uh, adulterated and becomes, uh, I don't know what kind of clause it might be, it would send out still signals to domestic investor, investors and foreign investors that, well, your investment in this country might not be that safe. It will not be that safe. Now, uh, investors have no time for do bull dung business. I, I avoid that uh, four-letter word, bull dung business. Mm -hmm. They have no time for that. You know, investors do not operate on altruistic uh, motions. They look for markets where they perceive they can derive the greatest benefits from their investment. Finish and clear. No, they would not come here. Oh, there was this wonderful man, Mandela. Therefore, we owe this country a favor. No, investors are just like you and me, acting in their own self-interest. We look at the bottom line, which is the best investor-friendly market. Now, we are in competition with other markets which is something that doesn't seem to have dawned on politicians. We are. We are competing on the basis of the most seductive policies, economic policies, to potential investors. That is where the competition is. This is where we're missing the boat in this country. And blame who? Blame the politicians. Blame who for, for the flight of capital? The politicians. Blame who for the fact that we have <laughs> this unemployment, cataclysm in this country. It's the politicians. It's all a consequence of policy. And so that's where our energy should be focused. And so coming to the EWC, we need to ensure that this does not become fact. If it becomes fact, heaven or hell <laughs> help us all or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, um, sort of playing on from the please question please of please Anthony, still also in my private capacity. Um, sort of continuing from what Lisa said, I, I think it is um, about survival too, because it's about Cyril's survival. And I think he had to cut a deal. And the alternative is worse. Now, um, the alternative would have been the other faction, we could be all in much more uh, dire straits. But so it's going to depend, and this is, I want you to comment on, on what deal he now does. If he sucks the EFF in, I think we did, because at what cost will that come on, on these sort of issues? Um, and you can see the influence the EFF has where they've got the DA by the short and curly 
it's, 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 it's a hell of a problem. So, um, but, so this is a question. If we look at Cyril the man, he either has the chance to go down in history as the greatest president we've ever had, leave Mr. Mandela aside, which was more of an emotional time, um, or he'll go down as the biggest f fool that's ever hit South Africa if, if this disaster mm -hmm. unfolds. Now, I cannot see, I'm playing devil's advocate now, I cannot see how he could possibly want that to be his legacy. Well, um, oh, you want to have a shot at it first? Or <laughs> no, 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 no there, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff, you, you know, that's, that, that, that you caused me to bring to the fore that I just want to unleash. Yeah. That's why, I, so I don't want to just, you know, coming up with all sorts of responses to the point that you're raising. But very briefly, let me just state this. I have empathy for Cyril Ramaphosa. Right? I have empathy for him because uh, there is the Zuma administration and all its remnants, some of whom are, st are, part, of, uh, are part of this, uh, the incumbent <coughs> administration. They will not roll over and die. We know that. They will not roll over and die because just consider this fact. If Cyril were to say, okay, fine, Let's prioritize all the crimes in this country. We start from the top, and we go right down. So we start with the people who used to hold the public office, high public offices in government, that is, and so on. What would happen? I think there would be a revolt within the ANC, right? And the, the support for Ramaphosa would be reduced. But the point is, alas, that is the difference between him and Mandela. Mandela would not have cared because Mandela would have said, my name, the legacy I leave behind, that's very important. I am for the country. I am not for my organization whilst holding this position, meaning the presidency of the country. And so the thing is, it's a case of what sort of legacy Ramaphosa wants to leave behind. It's all up to him. But what I can say is, I think he is just generally, like most politicians, he runs with the hares and hunts with the hounds. That's the sort of game that he is playing right now. Right? That's what defines a politician. You run with the hares and hunt with the hounds. And it's difficult to say that such a person, a political animal, will stick to principle in terms of what is in the best interest for the greatest numbers of people in this country? Politician is a politician. There was one slide that I came across um, a while ago where one person was asking another, what is the difference between a politician and pollution? <laughs> what the answer says, uh, 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 a politician uh, is, yeah, 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 if one person dies, no, 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 no let me just think straight here, <laughs> because it's so, it's so powerful, it's just, it's, it's pregnant with meaning. The, uh, what is the difference between a politician and pollution? Uh, a, po a politician is when you have one dead politician in the river. <coughs> Pollution is when you have all politicians dead in the river. It was words to that effect. So I've done some beautiful paraphrasing. But there's truth in that. There really it is pregnant with truth. It really is. Which is one of the reasons why I had never contemplated a career in politics, <laughs> being in parliament. Yeah, parliament is like a red light district. That said of people. If you go there with your Bible in hand and you want to proselytize people to be on the straight and narrow, you're not going to get anywhere. If you go there, you have to be part of that environment and, you know, and compromise and strike all sorts of deals and so on. You <coughs> have to be politically promiscuous. That's all. Just briefly, listening to your question, I'm reminded of coming out of a very nasty exam when I was at university and asking a friend of mine, how did he do? And he said, I want a cigarette. I haven't smoked for about 10 years, but like it makes me want a cigarette. Um, 
Look, uh, I think I think there's a few things. First of all, I don't think that the uh, the Zuma faction was entirely defeated. I think that they got a great deal of what they wanted, and I think this was one of them. Um, look, I I think that 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 you know one has to one has to maybe ad, uh, adjust one's paradigm. The idea that Saul Ramaphosa, um, you know, because he was in business, is somehow um, you know. Uh, a free marketeer or an ardent constitutionist because he negotiated the constitution, I think maybe that we we need to um, uh, we need to adjust our perspective. The fact that he helped write the constitution says he was a good negotiator, not necessarily that he was a great believer. Um, I, you know, I think I think that that, that that those are legitimate questions. Um, I suspect, though, having said that, that he has a better grasp of um, of. What uh, what is likely to work for South Africa than um, uh, than most. That being said, you know he's repeatedly endorsed uh, he's repeatedly endorsed this um, uh, this idea, and um, you know that there are other things that he's kind of just ignored. If you think, for instance, of there was a resolution about uh, downgrading South Africa's relations with Israel, and he just never mentioned that again. Uh, but this one he has hammered on about repeatedly, which suggests that. Um, he's willing, you know, he is willing to 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 um, uh, to see it rolled out. Perhaps the idea is that uh, you know we'll get the laws on the books, and then we'll only you know expropriate a you know decrepit building in downtown Joburg and say, see, we're being all radical economic transformation here. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think the problem is you know once once you sort of start down that road, you can you know you can be held to your rhetoric. I think this is a. I think there's a. There's, there's an element of a. You know, if if indeed this is his plan, I think there's an element of a lack of leadership there. Mm-hmm. So that I'm not going to do this because this is going to be destructive, and I don't. I don't want to be associated with it. Unfortunately, I think that is a that our political culture is about you know endlessly forgiving, and um, you know giving people what they want, um, or telling people what they want to hear, or telling the audience in front of you what um, uh, what you wanted to hear, which is why. Uh, Mark Offner with Johannesburg Bar. Uh, Terence, my question is rather brief. Um, this parliamentary committee is going to be looking at a series of submissions <coughs> to mm. consider whether they ought to make any constitutional changes. Right. What strategic advice would you have for those that are going to be writing submissions to persuade them not to implement the WC? Mm. Um, look, I, th- um, I think there's no substitute for a decent argument. Um, for pointing out the the, uh, the likely consequences, my concern though is looking ba- um, uh, looking at previous um, at previous examples where where government was very much in favour of something and there was a great deal of public outcry. For, I think for the secrecy bill, for instance, I, I don't know how much any of that any of that really helps. Uh, um, it concern it concerns me that 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 the way this is always uh, always presented is we are going ahead with this, not we are going to listen and then we are going to decide and we're going to like argue and whatever. Except in Afri forums overseas, then all of a sudden it becomes we need to talk about this. You know, come home, please. Those of you who've seen the seen the Dark Crystal, that movie from the early 1980s, please come to the castle, make peace. Um, uh, but yeah, sorry, that's a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit of flippancy on my, on my part. Um, but um, you know, uh, I'm 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 not sure just how. Um, uh, just how seriously this, um, uh, the government itself is taking this. They, t- they talk about having received 140,000 submissions, and I understand there was one energetic gentleman who sent the same thing 60,000 times, <laughs> which means his, be- his broadband's a lot better than mine. <laughs> um, but, uh, okay, let, and I, I actually wrote a, a, wrote a little piece about this. I said, okay, let's assume only one-third of those are, are real substantive submissions, and let's assume each of those only one and a half, uh, one and a half pages. That's all 69,000 pages. Um, yeah, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's reading, um, you know, Dr. Zhivago 700 times. I worked that one out. Um, <laughs> Dr. Zhivago, by the way, is, is, is a great book if you can, if you can deal with the, the way he changes the names all the time. Um, my, yeah, and just, just looking at that and they say, well, they're going to they're process the written submissions in two weeks. Well, you know, are they hiring 700 temps or something? Um, I, 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 I really don't get um, uh, don't get the sense that procedurally this is being um, uh, this, 
this is this is being done properly. I think actually that that may end up being um, uh, being a big issue as to whether um, as, to, as to whether it, 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 it passes muster. But certainly those who those who feel that they would that they would like to that they would like to participate, I think the the, the real argument just is that irrespective of, the, of whether this is constitutional, you change the constitution or what, it's a bad idea, and it, and it will hit the hardest those people who are putatively going to be helped by it. Uh, Eric, because there seems to be assumption here that we are not having a communist revolution and, and everything's framed in those terms. So what about it's just a simple, <coughs> is this is just a communist revolution just taking place slowly? <coughs> wow. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. I, I think what you've articulated is a credible sort of scenario. I wouldn't dismiss it. I wouldn't <coughs> dismiss it. But to really be able to home in on that in terms of this being reality, one would have to <coughs> home into the mindset of the people behind this, maybe outside of parliament, maybe operating in conjunction with the forces in parliament. It could be, right? But anyway, uh, just to suggest something here with some people who might want to to craft uh, uh, to craft a submission, even on an individual personal basis, uh, and for to to be sent to the committee, constitutional Revo review committee, I think it's important. Uh, let us say if you are a white person or a black person, or whether you're a white person, to articulate a perspective uh, in terms of how this would affect the, the most vulnerable people, the poorest people. That means number crunching, that means black people, largely how it would not be good for them in terms of their socio-economic fortunes, how it would not be good for them. Because, yes, there are companies who, you can be sure, have sent in their submissions from their business point of view as they see it. But there needs to be that voice out there. There needs to be many rational, uh, well-argued empirical cases you know, submissions substantiated by empirical evidence that argue the case that this is the worst case for the already vulnerable people, most vulnerable people, the poor people. And also to underscore the point that all sectors that constitute the fabric of the nation will be equally vulnerable. It's not only just whites, it's not only just the farmers, it's not only just the, the Afrikaner who own farms, it is everybody who would be equally, equally vulnerable. But the most vulnerable in that context, in this scenario, would be the poor people, by far. I, I just wanted to, 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 to bring in that point and can I just take one one, uh, uh, one, rem one more remark on something that I that I have seen um, an argument kind of in in, in favour or m more broadly saying well why don't we don't need property rights? So I say well you know China's a, a communist country and um, uh, you know you've got investors going into Cuba and uh, you know Mozambique doesn't allow you to own land. I think the important thing to point to point out is not so much what the uh, what the state of play is but the direction of play. Yeah, Mozambique was a um, uh, was a Marxist dog, uh, was, a, was a cesspit of Marxist dogma 20 years ago. Now um, it operates with, with, with a surprising amount of good sense. Um, you know, uh, the Chinese went, you know, while you know, not, not respecting uh, human freedom and, uh, to, any, to, to, to any realistic degree, at least have opened up, opened up enough that you can, you can do business there. Uh, you know, the Cubans as well. Um, so yes, you know, which way... Which way are you walking to um, in 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 the direction of, of of greater opportunities, of greater freedoms that um, uh, encourage people to uh, to invest or to, to to innovate, 
or you're going in the, in the other way to say, well, you know, go ahead and do it and, you know, we might come and grab it later. An empirical uh, ammunition in a bounce is related to the fact that, you know, open economies, free market economies, achieve greater economic growth rates, you know, higher levels of prosperity generally for all that they contribute, they explain the uh, upliftment from poverty of the <coughs> biggest numbers of people. China, for example, is a classic case. Now, it, it's, very, it's a strange paradox that Deng Xiaoping, at the helm of the <coughs> Communist Party of China, he was the one on whose charge the most, some of the most uh, radical <coughs> market reforms have been implemented. He started out in 1971 in the agricultural sector by dismantling the state-owned and state-managed uh, agricultural cooperatives. And from that point onwards, in the special economic zones, <coughs> the, this experiment was implemented widely, only in those areas. And today, within decades, within decades, as reported by the World Bank, <coughs> within Decades starting from 1971, more than 500 million Chinese have been uplifted from poverty. From poverty. So it can happen. It can happen. So there is a lesson to be learned from these empirical cases. And these are the sorts of e empirical examples that one could use to substantiate a case against the EWC. And one of them is just next door, for example, Zimbabwe. You know, why if we don't know the full picture, Emerson Nangwagwa said when in Pretoria, when he gave his first speech at being, uh, having assumed the presidency, he said, if you want to make money, come to Zimbabwe. Come to Zimbabwe if you want to make money. And with those words, he started handing over some of the farmlands to the previous owners. I don't know how, in how many cases. I don't know whether that's going to be on a comprehensive scale. I don't know as yet, but the thing is, he has come to understand, he has come to the realization that if you want the country to prosper, you open the economy. That's what you do. Make it easy for people to operate business, to go into businesses, right? make it easy so w when you do that what's going to result is that there's going to be the unleashing of the spirit of enterprise because then there's going to be a proliferation of businesses because it's easy to go into business and as a consequence of that there are going to be lots of people who are going to be employed it is just that easy just that easy without employing any ideologically informed solutions just the reality as to what makes people tick? What inspires people? What gets the entrepreneurs to get up and go and expand the businesses and employ more people and generate more wealth with more people being involved in the wealth creation process as opposed to many of them being, on the being in the dole for social grants, you know, which come from the taxpayers at the end of the day, subsidized by them. Thank you. Leon Merrill, the Free Market Foundation's executive director, to make a few brief closing comments. Just closing remarks. Uh, firstly, thanks to the speakers. Uh, I'm going to introduce, uh, sum up what seemed to me to be the highlights, but introduce an aspect that has been to me extraordinarily absent from the discourse, uh, sort of unforgivably absent. Uh, and that is that black South Africans have been and continue to this day to be expropriated without compensation on a vast scale. It's happening all the time, yeah, under many contexts, in many places, and people are talking as if somehow this is a new thing in South Africa. And let me just point out how commonly this takes place. Whenever the government in the past or in the present wants to build a dam or make a road or build a park or have a university or hospital or any development, whatever, it expropriates the land that is required, <coughs> for example, a new dam site, a new power station, whatever it might be. And along the way, imagine a road, a highway, 
the people who have freehold property rights get expropriated and compensated. Those are white people, mainly. The people along the way who do not have freehold property rights, black people mainly, living in settlements and villages and in formal properties or whatever they townships, Soweto, if they want to expropriate a part of Soweto to build a new shopping centre or whatever, the black people living there in the past and to this day have their land and their property and their houses and their assets and their shops and their stores and their arable allotments expropriated in vast numbers without compensation. So we need to understand it's happening all the time. One of the things one would have liked to see in the new South Africa is that that stops happening. Is that black people get the same protection that white people have had and continue to have on balance. So expropriation without compensation is not new. It's not some radical new proposal. It has been something that has been the norm for black South Africans under the new government since 1994. Certainly under apartheid. And so that's the uh, one thing I think should be added and is just commonly forgotten and ignored. Black people have been and continue to be overwhelmingly the victims of expropriation without compensation. Another thing that Temba never mentioned, which I want to add as a big paradox, is that he and I and others, which became known in Parliament during the Cadessa process as the Business Caucus, odd name, <laughs> met with for, for the people who were in it, and even Cyril Ramaphosa, with whom we met at the time, uh, he said, I'm surprised to see Leon and Temba here being called the Business Caucus. But nonetheless, this is a piece of history. Temba and I and various other people, including Raymond Parsons and some others, met with Cyril Ramaphosa and a Lady Condor, Baleka and Betty, after the draft constitution had been approved, without a property clause. The discussion we had with the important thing is President Ramaphosa was do you really want a future South Africa in which black South Africans do not have secure property rights? And we completely changed the discourse from whites want property rights and black people don't. And said this is about black people. And Sir Ramaphosa and the lady in Bale and Baleka agreed with us that that had simply not been registered in the discourse. People hadn't actually thought, now hold on a sec, black people fought and died to get property rights. Do you really want a constitution in which black people don't have property rights? This idea to this day that it is somehow a white versus black thing is the great tragedy and misconception. So the irony that we negotiated with Cyril to add it at the last minute uh, when P. F. W. de Klerk, for example, said the greatest accomplishment of the National Party was to keep De Stem as the national anthem. <laughs> we had to persuade Cyril to put a property rights clause in, not for white people, but for black people. Now that is where we sit here today, and it's to me astounding that uh, and Timber is one of the few people who points that, points that out, and I, you know, one has to register that. Now, the, the other thing that is not in the discourse, and a lawyer like Mark Oppenheimer, and uh, I've got a few lawyers in the audience, you can see them around, will realize that who implements expropriation without compensation? Now, I spoke to a senior banker, a very, very big heavyweight business person in South Africa, and you're probably assuming it was a white person, you don't necessarily have to make that assumption, about this. And what he said was, oh, you know, we've spoken with Cyril and it's not really very serious and don't worry, it's rhetoric and it's cosmetic and so on. And I thought to myself, this discussion is taking place as if the people now in power, now having a discussion, are the ones for whom it's relevant. That if Cyril says, don't worry, we won't harm food production, and Ronald Momola says, no, no, it's actually not about farms, it's about urban houses. That's supposedly the policy. Then the question is, how relevant is it what Cyril says? The answer is it's completely irrelevant in the short term.
because the people who implement it are thousands of government officials in all government departments and agencies have the right to expropriate for parks and hospitals and schools and roads and dams and irrigation schemes. Eskom has the power to expropriate for putting power lines or power stations or whatever. Uh, SARS has, not SARS, uh, railways have the right to expropriate. What we don't, what, what's not being picked up here is that junior lowly officials in local governments are the ones who would implement it. Just comprehend the opportunity here for corruption, victimization of people with the wrong religion, the wrong political loyalty, the wrong support, the wrong tribe, the wrong values. It is junior officials by the thousand who make the actual decision on the ground, not the president, not the ANC's NEC. Mm -hmm. They are not present when this gets implemented. But the more important thing which Timber pointed out is the long term. This is a, once gone, this is not going to come back for 50, 100, 200 years. Long after Cyril is gone, long after the ANC is gone, long after the current white versus black dialogue is gone, the power to expropriate without compensation is there. And is that really what you want for your grandchildren and great-grandchildren? It's not about race at all. It's actually irrelevant. Frankly, I... Farm prices are showing that actually farmers are not particularly worried about it, and they're probably right. A slight plateauing off of farm prices. The real problem is little people living in shanty towns and squatter settlements and rural areas, and they are the people who have been and will increasingly be the, the real victims. It's not people living in Bryanston. I can't see a single property being expropriated without compensation in Bryanston. It won't house the thousands of people you saw marching in Hermanus. The property that will be expropriated without compensation is the land of lower, poor, middle class, shanty town, traditional areas and so on. So that's, that came out for which uh, I want to thank you. Uh, uh, um, there was mention made of the actual empirical data and how relevant it is in the land survey. Now, let me just point out something that is profoundly flawed in the so-called audits. And even you didn't refer to it. And I want to encourage you in the future to note that the assumption is made that it's an audit of land by area. When they say X percent of the land is held by some particular race or state or whatever, they mean by area. That attaches the same value of land to an acre in the Kalahari as an acre in Greenpoint. Land by area is a completely irrelevant statistic. And I can't understand why people keep trotting it out and debating it as if it has any relevance whatsoever. Land by value is what matters. There is no audit of that. No one has the slightest idea. We do know that over, over half of all the property transactions being re registered in the deed registry, the person acquiring it is a black South African. So we do know that the quantity, that's the next measure, area, value, or quantity, the number of properties in the deeds registry. When they say that they said 40% would be redistributed, did they mean 40% of the number of properties? Or do they mean 40% of the value? Or do they mean 40% of the area? Or the other thing, ways, of course, by usage. This idea that it's got something to do with area is just farcical. You shouldn't get into a debate about how reliable the audit is. You should say the audit conceptually is rubbish. It should be dismissed as not even worthy of opening. What it says is have no relevance whatsoever because, as I say, it attaches the same value to an acre in the Kalahari as an acre here where we are now in Brownstone. Now, you, you don't have to be clever to know that that's idiotic. I mean, you can't be more polite about it than to call it idiotic. So I want to encourage you not even to play the game. You give it some kind of credibility and legitimacy which it shouldn't have. So then, just uh, one or two last points. Timber did discuss the alternatives, and I want to just remind you of that. That what this will achieve, no one knows. 
Cyril Ramaphosa tells us, don't worry, effectively when he says it won't harm food security and investor conflict, what he's saying is it'll achieve nothing. We're not really going to do anything with it. That's the, that's the subtext of saying don't worry, it won't harm the economy. Under him. But he doesn't even seem to register, and he should, because he's actually a good constitutional lawyer. He co-authored a textbook on constitutional law. That the people who implement it are not him. He has no control over its implementation. <laughs> it's implemented by lowly officials. But as Timber said, what can you do that will make a difference? So we have the president who's implementing the measure telling us actually that measure will have no difference. I mean, that's really what he's saying. Don't worry, it's just cosmetic. It's not really going to change it. You know, maybe a few token redistributions of a family holiday cottage or something. But the point Temba made, which I want to leave you with, is there is a lot that can be done. The first and most obvious one is just issue a title deed to every black person who currently occupies a piece of land. We're talking there up to 10 million property owners with land worth something like a trillion rand that's virtually an entire year's budget, is waiting to be converted from dead capital <laughs> into real dynamic live capital in the hands of black South Africans right now. Over half of all the farms are for sale in South Africa. They can be bought. And just to point out how cheap that is, the total value of all commercial farms in South Africa is about 90 billion rand. That's less than half the cost overrun on one power station with DPO Casino, which is 200 million per power station. So if you just built the power stations on budget or even overrun the budget by only 50% instead of 100%, all the farms could already have been purchased. They are worth very little. I mean, emotionally and food and all of that's worth a lot, but the actual capital is negligible. You can actually bring about transformation empowerment on a vast scale economically without this measure. This measure, in a way, is a real fraud because it creates an illusion that there will be transformation when, in fact, there will be none. And what Temba tried to point out is that there are very effective, cheap, quick ways of bringing about real transformation on a really vast scale, and this measure is diverting attention from so this, you could almost say, is a white conspiracy. This is a white monopoly capital conspiracy against the black South Africans. It's to create an impression that something is being done when it, in fact, is not being done. This was cooked up by, what's the firm in Britain? Uh, Bell, Pottinger. Bell Pottinger. This is a Bell Pottinger plot <laughs> against black South Africans. Because this is the ultimate fraud to be perpetrated on black South Africans. And the president actually even says so when he says it's not going to cause any economic consequence. Well then, what on earth is it for? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Leon, for your uh, remarks, and to our two speakers, Kimba and Jared. Thank you very much. Our next event is on the 30th of May. It's an